Step tools for us just like sun, air, and water, we can now without it, definitely. In this presentation, let's get up to step with the latest features in Google Chrome Dev Tools in 2018. I don't want to waste your time. We have a Paul Irish. Please show your welcome. All right, hey guys. Uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about some Chrome DevTools stuff. Um, raise your hand if you've used Chrome DevTools ever. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Raise it again if you've used Chrome DevTools in the last week. <laughs> all right, all right. Great, okay. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk, we're gonna break this talk up into four sections. Uh, authoring, accessibility, performance, and JavaScript. And we're gonna start uh, at the top. So authoring is all about just creating that UI, creating a great experience for your user. And uh, this is a lot of the reason that we, that we use DevTools so often, is just to go in, inspect element, tweak styles, right? Um, and there's, obvious, there's a few ways to do this. Um, the most common way is, well, you just open up DevTools and you, you know, just play around with styles and uh, kind of just like tweak it till you like it and then just uh, like copy paste it back into your project. Um, and that's cool, that's totally fine. It's how we all do things. Um, there's another more kind of advanced way called workspaces where you take your entire project's check out like the entire folder and you add it into DevTools. And then you can kind of use DevTools as a text editor. Um, and I'm not talking about that today. Uh, there are good videos online and, and uh, you can check that out. But there's another uh, kind of uh, way that we work on things. Sometimes we're looking at a site and we don't own it. It's not, we do not have a checkout of that project on our machine but we'd still like to kind of mess with it and try some things out. Um, that's where local overrides make sense. So this is a new feature in DevTools and uh, it allows you to manipulate any site and you use uh, files on disk to keep track of things. So best way is to show a demo. Let's do that. Um, hmm, yeah, this website. <laughs> Great website. Um, and, and yeah, whoever designed it did a great job, but we're gonna make some changes to it, if that's okay. All right. Yeah, wow, that's a big DevTools. All right, all right, all right. That size. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> right, so uh, yeah, so we have some changes to make. Um, yeah, one thing, you know, uh, this right here, the, the, the day that it's on, you know, I was looking at this before and I noticed it like had a little bit of uh, letter spacing on it. Um, and so you can actually just see, yeah, we have some letter spacing, but what if we up, ooh, yeah, like that's, this is nice, very modern, you know, good approach. Um, we can uh, obviously change the color. Um, any favorites out there? Favorite colors? Hot pink, hot pink in the back, that's what I, I heard that, yeah. That's great, okay, good. Uh, great changes, lovely, um, so good. However, uh, you know, you commonly get to this point where you've tweaked things, it looks good, and then you know what happens when you come up here and you hit reload? Like, it's just gone, right? Like, the changes don't stick around, you can't keep going after you reload. Um, you'd have to copy it out. So. That's tricky. But we can try this again uh, once we turn on local overrides. So the way that we do that is we go over to the sources panel and hit this little guy right here and go into overrides. Um, now you have to pick a folder on disk to save them. Um, and so I'll just go here, here, uh-huh. And you just need to pick one location. You only have to do this once. My Overrides, great. And give DevTools permission to access that folder and read from it and write to it. All right, now that's done. Um, 
And oh yeah, let's go. Let's go try try these changes again. Uh, yeah, okay. Big letter spacing. Color. Cornflower blue. Ooh, that is nice. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. Now you see this little guy right here. This is a the, just a little purple dot. That purple dot is an indication that it's um, hooked up. In fact, it says it's, well, let's see if we can read that, linked to this file on disk. Um, so in fact, you can actually see this. Uh, here's my overrides, and here's that file on disk. So apparently, that file is just being used in LinkedIn, which means I can reload and, oh yeah, still cornflower. Nice. Really cool. And in fact, the f that it's, uh, since it is saved onto disk, that means that we can take this and, for instance, drag it into Sublime and change this to awesome website. <laughs> Save that, refresh, and oh yeah, <laughs> it is. Oh, this is powerful. Um, now, right here, I'm changing uh, CSS, but it's an inline style tag. Um, but we can change other things. Um, there's a uh, reset CSS on this site, and uh, it has a box sizing border box, which is the best thing ever. Best ever. I'm, I'm such a fan. Um, so. Yeah, that seems good. Oh, oh, you know what is really good in the star selector is uh, transition all uh, 500 milliseconds. It's so good. You're going to love it. All right. <clears throat> so that's good. Um, well, let's see. The logo. Hmm. Yeah, logo. It's good. Uh, but it could use it, some upgrades. So I'm gonna, it's an image, okay. And I'm just gonna view it here. Um, and over in the network panel, I can find it too. Uh, it's just a logo. There it is, yeah, great, okay. Logo. I can say save for overrides. And this just says, hey, take this image, save it over in overrides, get purple dot, we need that. Now that it's here, what we can do is we can take a new image and drag it into it. Like, for instance, this, what is this? New improved logo that I have on my computer. I don't know. Oh, yeah. That is nice. Classy. All right. And so now we refresh. Oh, yeah. That's good. Uh, let me try one more thing. Let's see if that color transition is still here. Um, hey, 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 hey. Oh, there it was. Ooh. Ooh. It's like a little slow. What is happening? Just fade, fade, fade. Ooh. All right. I don't know why it's consecutive like that. That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah, the transition. Yeah, I added. <laughs> I just don't know why it's like this one and then that one. Anyways, <clears throat> okay. So that's local overrides. Uh, make any changes that you want. Um, they're saved to disk. Um, you can see that there's the HTML, reset CSS, the, the logo. Um, I can change these, they still work. And it's a nice way to just kind of manipulate a site in a really lightweight way. All right, go back to the slides. All right, uh, who uses CSS variables? Yeah, they're good, they're fun. Um, we actually use them in the Chrome DevTools uh, themselves uh, to create the UI. Um, and we noticed there's probably some ways that we can improve things. For instance, this is how things looked in Chrome uh, just a few months ago. You can see I have, um, I'm using a variable here for this background, and there's another one down here. But like, what are these colors? I don't know. Uh, so now, just a little color swatch gives you a reminder. It's nice. Um, and if you hover over uh, the 
variable value. Uh, you'll just get a little tooltip reminding you exactly what the value is. Um, and of course, this works with other variables too. Um, doesn't have to be a color. It can be kind of anything. Uh, so nice improvements there. Um, and there's one more thing too. If you open up the color picker, you might have seen these palettes, the color palettes down here at the bottom. Um, now there's a few different palettes that you can choose from. And there's a new one. And set, uh, in addition to material and page colors, there's also CSS variables. And the CSS variables palette collects the variables in the page um, and shows them. And in fact, it's not every single variable in the page. It's only the ones that apply to the currently selected element. Um, kind of the, take the CSS cascade and, and make sure that it's only those, uh, only those variables. So anyways, um, they're presented there. And the nice thing is that when you click on them and you select, for instance, this text link color, it applies the var text link color uh, to the style, not the resolved color value, um, which is what you'd want. So some nice, tr some nice improvements there to how we can work with variables. Um, now, when you're choosing colors, um, one thing that you want to keep in mind is accessibility. Uh, color contrast is one of the largest accessibility issues out there. And we've made some improvements um, to how that can work. We now have color contrast uh, evaluation built right into the color picker. So I'm going to show that right now. Uh, okay, yeah, here we go. Do, 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 do. All right, so pink. Well, it's like a, it's like a pink, but um, is this a good color for me to be using? I'm not really sure. Um, but we have a contrast ratio item right here in the color picker now. Um, and you can open this up, and it tells me to pick a background color. Now, most of the time, DevTools will be able to automatically determine the background color of this element. Uh, and this, this time, it couldn't. So uh, what I can just do is go over and pick the purple. Um, all right. Ooh. It says no good. All right. So now I can actually have live feedback on what's a good color and what's bad. Oh, bad. Oh, man. The, uh, that transition <laughs> is killing me. All right. It was nice while it lasted. All right. Let's try that again. Uh, Okay, okay. Yeah, good, great. Whew. Um, right, so you can see this line going across uh, the color uh, spectrum. And so on one side of the line is good, and on the other side is bad. Um, you can see that down here. Uh, this is basic, this is the WCAG um, uh, ratings for color contrast, AA and AAA. Um, and so you want to have something that's uh, a, a contrast that's higher than these. All right, well, that's about it. That's, that's that. Um, so you can try this out. This is now in Chrome Stable. Um, and yeah, give it a shot. Um, another tool that can uh, help you with accessibility is Lighthouse. Uh, it can evaluate a page um, and tell you all sorts of accessibility issues. Um, if you're not familiar, it can it, you give it your page, and it creates a personalized report uh, across five different categories, looking at accessibility, performance, um, best practices, progressive web app, and SEO. And um, it does a bunch of analyses and returns to you some recommendations, some insights, some metrics. Um, my favorite part is the performance section, where it uh, looks at the kinds of optimizations you can do to make your site faster and tells you about how much faster each one would make your site. Um, uh, Lighthouse is available as a Chrome extension uh, in the Chrome DevTools in the Audits panel and also as a NPM module. Um, and we keep adding new functionality and new audits to it. Um, so it's always checking uh, more and more things. Um, and there's a great new feature that we added into the DevTools uh, to uh, look at the diagnostic trace, the performance trace that Lighthouse recorded. Uh, so I'm going to show a video of this in action.
Okay. So we're in the DevTools, and I just uh, said, let's record a performance um, uh, run. So it just reloaded the page. It's gathering a bunch of diagnostic information. Um, and now, here's our report. So this is uh, the Lighthouse report. And up here in the top right is a view trace button. And now, uh, that just loads into the performance panel, and now we're looking at the full details. Um, and so we can see all of the important things, any long tasks, um, any long paints, we can understand exactly what Lighthouse was um, thinking when it gave us certain recommendations. Um, now, I will point out that in that video on my site, the performance score was 77. It was 77 is not good enough. I'm wondering maybe we can improve that performance score. Um, in fact, one way that we could improve that is actually to bring back our friend, um, the local overrides feature. So first thing that we're going to do is record a baseline um, uh, trace. Now, what I want to do is I want to measure how long it takes from the beginning of the HTML coming in to the first screenshot, the first time that we have a real paint um, on the screen. So I'm just going to drag that section. OK, so I just dragged from the beginning of the HTML response to uh, where the, the, like the first meaningful paint of text came in. All right, so now down here at the bottom, it's telling us that we're looking at just over 2,000 milliseconds. Um, and right towards the end of that time, actually, yeah, taking much of that time is these requests, and they're actually just they're fonts, right? The web fonts. Web fonts are are tricky from a um, tricky for performance. So the problem here is actually that they're just being fetched really late. They're being fetched 800 milliseconds into the page. Uh, this right here is kind of I'm being a little bit fancy, but I just needed to get the URLs of those web fonts, and now I'm just going to copy them to the clipboard. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you this later. Don't worry about it. All right. Now we're going to go back over to the sources panel, and we have local overrides turned on. And we're just going to take those URLs and turn them into link rel preload. All right. I think that's about right. Fonts, link rel preload, has font, cross source. Yep, OK, good. So now we should be able to preload those requests and get them going a lot sooner. Um, all right, we have local overrides, so we should just be able to refresh, and hopefully it takes less than 2,000 milliseconds. All right, from the HTML to the first meaningful paint. There they are. Good. We see that the web fonts are starting really early, um, not at 800 milliseconds, really early. And down here at the bottom, oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, oh, no. Come on, just, just, there we go. All right, 13, yeah, uh, 1,400, 14 milliseconds. Um, so we're, we're about half a second faster than before. And this was nice because we're able to just try this out. In reality, making this sort of a change would mean, uh, you know, just uh, like changes to how my CMS of, of my blog works. And, and it's a lot more time consuming to make that sort of a change. So local overrides is really nice, too, for evaluating if a performance change is actually worth it and just doing it the hacky way. All right. Now, we're getting deep into performance, and I want to show a few more things. Um, so we've been looking at the performance panel, the flame chart, um, and there's a new kind of tweak here. Um, there's multiple tracks in the flame chart. Uh, there's the main thread, um, and there will be other content and other tracks. In this case, this is a out-of-process iframe, but you also see tracks for web workers, service workers. Um, and now whenever you select a track, the summary at the bottom, this kind of summary, the bottom up, the call tree, they will be reflecting which track you have selected. Um, and this allows you to focus in on exactly the content that you care about. It also allows for a really nice feature um, this is one of my favorite things. If you use a framework like React um, or something like it, um, you may have noticed that when you look at a performance trace, uh, 
you see function names that, whew, oh, no, uh, wait for it, patience, okay, okay. All right, uh, you may notice when you've d done performance work that uh, you see function names like complete unit of work, uh, work loop, update class component, and you're just like, I don't know what components you're talking about. This is not useful to me. Um, now, the nice thing is that some frameworks, um, in addition, use user timing and actually um, annotate what's happening. So now you can actually see um, from the user timing uh, information, you can see things like what component it was. Oh, the topics component was mounting. Uh, the switch component was mounting. Uh, and you can get the, f the full breakdown of the initialization, but now summarized with the bottom up and the call tree story. Um, yeah. Now, I know that the performance panel and that flame chart is like, it's a lot of information. And I imagine that you've probably opened it, looked at it, and been like, yeah, not going to happen. Uh, that's fine. It's OK. Um, the performance monitor is a new tool that's a little bit more lightweight. So, sorry, what I just did here is Command Shift P or Control Shift P. This opens up the command palette. Um, and you can just type in whatever you want. So, we go to the performance monitor. And this is just collecting a bunch of stats uh, completely live the CPU usage, the heap, DOM nodes. Um, and you're able to see how these things change over time as this page loads in. Uh, which is kind of cool. So just a light, lightweight way to understand some performance metrics as they happen. All right, <clears throat> moving on to JavaScript. Um, and the first thing is async await. Uh, asynchronous JavaScript is, is kind of how we, how we do things these days. And async await specifically has made things uh, quite a bit better. Um, so here's a basic example of a sync await code. You can see that we have to have this async keyword around the function if we're using the await inside of it, right? That's just how it is. Um, and this is OK, but it's a little tricky, especially if you want to try things out in the console. So uh, something that we introduced not too long ago was top level await in the console. So you can see here we're going to fetch that same thing. Um, and, but just await it. Um, and so we don't have to wrap this with an extra async function. And then we take that and we await the JSON method. And it just returns whenever that promise resolves. And the last thing, we're going to get fancy. We're going to use do, uh, dollar underscore. This references the, oops, this let references the last result right here. And so we just reference that and iterate over items uh, mapping that. Fancy, fancy. All right, but having a top-level await in the console is really nice, but also when we're breakpoint debugging, uh, that's a time when we're dealing a lot with a, a, synch a synchronicity, a synchron, is that how you say it? A synchronous, yeah, a synchron, mm-hmm, okay. So um, you might have been in this situation before. Now, some basic code, we have a set timeout inside of that, we have a console log. Now I'm paused here, right? And what happens is, like uh, in Chrome a year ago, I'd be paused, and once I hit step into, we'd step past it, right? We'd go down. And that's not really what we want or what we think. But in Chrome of today, uh, we step into, and we go into it. We pause immediately inside the invocation asynchronously. So now step into is async aware. Um, and so this works with set timeout, it works with promises, uh, it works with uh, a number of different um, uh, asynchronous events in JavaScript. Um, now there's uh, some more improvements. If you've ever worked with a web worker, you, can, you know that debugging it is a little bit challenging. When you create a new worker now, you can, if we're paused here, we can step into the creation of the worker. And so this will just go into the worker and pause on the very first line there. 
Uh, and now, later on, you might be paused when you're about to post message into the worker, and we can click step into, and we will just hop the thread boundary and be paused on the inside of that on message handler. And same thing going back. We're in the worker, and we're gonna just hop back on the post message back to the main thread of the page. Uh, so this is a really nice way uh, to deal with handling workers when it's really unclear how we're going back and forth. Now we've been talking about JavaScript debugging, and breakpoints, but the console is home to us a lot of the time. Um, and the command line API is a bunch of methods that we have available inside the console that, can, uh, that we can use just right there. This is one that's been there for a long time, but nearly no one knows about it. Um, copy. You just pass it anything, it copies it to the clipboard. So uh, you have some uh, element, and you copy that, and it'll just copy the outer HTML to the clipboard. If you have an object, it'll just prettify it uh, and copy the JSON. Um, this is really nice when you like have some complex object and you just need to get it out of the browser to a file or something. Uh, throw it to copy. But there's some other um, ones too. Debug is a method that allows you to pause in the debugger whenever a method is called. And now you can pass native functions into it. So pass it query selector, and the debugger will just pause whenever query selector is called. Um, monitor is another one. It logs every call to set uh, any call to the method, and it'll just say, these were the arguments. This is the stack. Um, just saying, like, this is who used the function. Uh, so you could do that, too, with native functions here. Uh, this will just be telling you, well, who is calling set timeout and with what arguments. Um, and there's one more. This one's new uh, and, and pretty powerful. Query objects. A little, little different. Uh, so let me explain this. Uh, we're going to create a new class and create two instances of that class and just make them a little bit unique. And then we're going to use query objects. And we pass in the, uh, the class, the original class reference. And what this is going to do is it's going to look across the entire JavaScript heap to say, hey, like, tell me all of the instances that exist across the entire heap um, and report them back to me. I don't know where they are and what scopes and what execution contacts, uh, but I need them. Um, and so you'll get back just whatever matched. So we can get that back. Um, let me try and show this another way. Uh, before, uh, just a few hours ago, Meng Chi showed us this really cool uh, um, site. Uh, so the wind map, I love this thing. Uh, really powerful visualization. And I was playing around and I was wondering maybe we could make some changes. Um, so this kind of visualization is done with, um, done with Canvas, uh, I think. Yeah, it's done with Canvas. So what we can do is try and get a reference to that Canvas. Now, I don't know what their code is, I don't know where it is, but what we can do is just type query objects and pass it canvas rendering context. Yeah, oh, sweet. And we get nine contacts back. All right. Uh, I think it's, yeah, okay, it's this one, first one. Great. Now, this is the, the pro tip, is when you wanna work with this, um, query objects didn't return this, it just kind of like, it asynchronously printed it. Um, <clears throat> so what you do is just right click this, and store as global variable. And yeah, there we go. All right, so now we can access it directly. So we'll temp, oh, temp one, zero. Um, and you know what? Here's, we can just make some changes. Uh, global composite operation will just lighten it up. Well, hey, hey, make some, help. no? No, we can. Mm. What? I broke it. Um, doesn't matter. 
<clears throat> what matters <laughs> is that that worked. <laughs> Whatever I was doing in Canvas, just forget about it. I'm not good at Canvas. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, in the console, there's one last thing I want to show. The, the console is, is where we spend a lot of time. It's where we understand kind of how JavaScript works. And the way that we've interacted it is always we say something, and then it replies to us. And then we try and say something again, and it comes back. And so whenever we're debugging, you kind of just back and forth. And we thought that we could try and reduce the iteration speed here and make it faster to get the answer that you want. Um, and so we've introduced a feature called eager evaluation. Um, and the best way is just to show it. So I'll give you a quick demo. OK. <coughs> we have here is a bit of JavaScript. We have a regular expression. And we're going to run it against this string. Um, it's just a phone number. Um, and we're trying to parse out a phone number. Yeah, OK, good. Uh, so let's just finish this off. Now, watch as I close off this last paren. Hmm. So I did not hit enter, but DevTools is already showing me the result. Um, and the cool thing is that this is completely live. And any changes that I make will just be reflected right here. I don't have to hit enter. So um, now I do notice that we have this uh, 0 through 9 character range. Uh, we could probably change all of these to just be slash D. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I guess that works. I didn't break anything. It still matches, right? By the way, um, if you want to do multiple selection, like pop, pop, just, uh, uh, what is it? It's control D. Yeah, that's <laughs> the magic key keyword. All right. Control D is, is selection, so we just change that. And yes, we're still matching. OK, good. Yeah, that would break it. Yep, that's good. Um, the other thing that I want to do is pull out the area code, right? The, the type A area code right here. So um, what we can do is create just groups in the regex. So we have these multiple cursors. So let's just use these. So let's add some parens around that. OK, good. Oh, look, like our groups. Ping, ping, ping. All right, sweet. And so now we can just grab the first item. Oh, first item. Right, yeah, yeah. There we go. Cool. No, wait, sorry, I can't type. Yeah, great. OK. So this is really nice, because I was able to iterate a little bit, um, figure out how it worked, and get my answer all without hitting Enter, except for when I, when I knew it was all correct. Um, now, let's try something else. Uh, let's see. And this is my website. I haven't updated it in a long time. Um, let's try something. Let's do document query selector all. And we'll just grab all of the links. Now, what I want to do is just grab all the link text. Like, what is, what is the text of all these links? Um, so what we could do is we could map over them uh, and grab text content, map. Oh, map is undefined. Map is undefined. Map is, oh, because it's a node list. And node lists don't have map. Arrays have map. Node, OK. What's a good way to change a node list to an array? Suggestions? Hmm? Yes. Yes. We'll spread it. We'll spread it. You in the back. So smart. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah. Oh, there we go. An array. I mean, we could have like array from. I heard that uh, array from is also a, a good suggestion. That was you right here in the front row. That was a good call. Um, but I like the uh, the spread. This is my favorite. All right, so we're good. We have that, and now we can map. Yes, there we go. Map e text content. Here we go. Cool. All right, we got all the text. Um, all right, let's sort it to make it look good. Um, oh, there's a white space. This is funky white space. We don't need that. Let's just trim this. Uh, trim, trim, misspelled trim. Didn't have to hit enter to get this error, so that's nice. Um, and then we have the empty one. I just, hold on. 
filter, boolean. Everybody lo loves this trick. Okay, yeah. All right, good. That's what do we want. Okay, we have, wow, yeah, there we go. So in this case, we're able to just make these changes fine, um, and, and get the answer that I want pretty quickly. Um, now, the cool thing about eager evaluation is that what we did is we introduced a new mode in the JavaScript engine in V8 that allows us to evaluate and uh, make sure that there are no side effects happening. So basically, run this, but do not uh, cause any side effects. And if it tries to make a side effect, we just completely bail and stop running it. Um, so that means that whatever you type in here, if we're showing a result, then it did not have an effect on any external state. Um, and this is really powerful, and it actually allows us to make a change uh, to one of our other features, right? The completion. You notice how when you type in document, you get all the completion options. Um, but uh, sometimes you have uh, more dynamic content, and we can actually use this feature to create more dynamic completions. So let's take this. All right, I have an object uh, about FEDC, um, but imagine this came over as JSON, right? A JSON string. Um, and so I'll just make this into a string, and we will uh, throw JSON parse around it. Now, uh, my dev tools have you know, never really seen this object before, but when I uh, try this out, uh, we can see that in my completions are design track and developer track and FEDC, completely being evaluated behind the scenes so that I can just, yeah, that's the one. All right, sweet. So it's really powerful stuff, um, and uh, I hope you try it out. Um, and let me know what you think. You can always hit me up on Twitter if you have any bugs, any feature requests. Um, you can also file bugs. Just tell us what, what we need to do to make you guys happy. Um, and that's it. Yeah, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.